Jesus in his own in his own time knew exactly what was taking place and what was quickly approaching. And, and, it, and it records that this this time was a time when he his time had come, and he said that my time has come. And he would soon embrace the cross as he offered himself uh, the atoning sacrifice for our sin. Now these verses again give us a look into the intimate moment, revealing the instruction regarding a sacred observance that all who believe continue until today. And all who believe should continue today. And it should be done with reverence, it should be done with, with reference, and it should be done with honor to the one who placed himself upon the cross for yours and my sin. And as Jesus shared this final meal, the disciples spoke of its great significance, revealing the provision and grace of God for the sin of mankind. And so each time we partake of this bread and, and this cup, we share this message of provision. We share this message of, of redemption. We share the message of, of love and grace and mercy. And so for a moment, we'll start with verses 20, 12 through 16, of the preparation. And I'm not going to read them all again. I'm just going to want you to... To, to have your Bibles open and look at them uh, through Mark 16, 12 through 16, and the, the verse 12 gives us the occasion and the timing. It was the first day of the week, and it was unleavened bread, and they had killed the Passover, or they had presented the Passover, and his disciples shed unto him, Where wilt thou have us to go to prepare that, that thou may eat the Passover? And this was a time uh, set aside centuries prior in celebration of God's mighty hand of provision as, as the people departed from Egypt. So tip back, if you would, with me to Exodus chapter 12. And let's just look at some interesting scripture. Uh, I, I want to kind of review some things this morning because I think it's good for us to review. I think it's good for us to be reminded of, of prophecy and reminded of the things that lead us, uh, that, that take us into the things that we do. Why? Why do we follow this teaching? And it all started back here in Exodus chapter 12. And it says, on that faithful night that they were expected to offer a lamb as a sacrifice. Now, I, I'm not going to read the whole thing, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I want us to understand something. The Jews are, 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 were, were in captivity. And God had put out all of these plagues, trying to get them freed and trying to get them freed. And then this final plague was about to take place. And it says he, uh, he, on a faithful night, they were expected to offer a lamb as a sacrifice, putting the blood of the sacrifice in the doorposts and lintels, preparing the lamb uh, uh, along with bitter herbs and unleavened bread for their meal. This was also referred to at the time as the Feast of Unleavened, but there was an order to this meal. And I think that's what's interesting to me, because I, I, you know me, I, I, as I get older, the more I enjoy history because. Uh, I have no idea what tomorrow is bringing, so I'm trying to get ready for it from looking at yesterday. And, and, but anyway, in, in the historical aspect of this, there was, there was a, 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 an order to the meal. There was a special way that this meal was set up and it was, that it was uh, enjoyed. And so, first of all, they drank a cup of red wine. Uh, there was a ceremonial washing of hands which symbolized the need for spiritual and moral cleansing. This was followed by eating the bitter herbs, which symbolized their bondage in Egypt. And then they drank a second cup of wine, at which time the head of the household explained the meaning of Passover. And then they would sing the first two of the hello uh, psalms, uh, 113 uh, through 114, and they would sing these two psalms. Next, a lamb was brought out, and the head of the household distributed the pieces of it with the unleavened bread. And the unleavened bread symbolized haste. In other words, don't waste time. Prepare yourselves. And so it didn't have time to rise and do everything that we normally do with, with making bread. And uh, so it was unleavened bread. There was no time to allow the dodoring. They drank a third cup of wine. Then they would kick the Conclude the meal by singing the rest of the hello uh, psalms of 115 through 118. So if you if you want to take the time to read those, it, it's kind of beautiful reading. It's a, it's a great portion of scripture. And in the instructions given in Exodus 12, there's specific guidelines for selecting the lamb. And I found out some interesting things here that I had probably read and maybe I've heard somewhere else at some point in time, but I just kind of slowly read down through this. So, Verse 3 of Exodus 12 says this, 
says this, it said, speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb. Now, just kind of look at the, the wording there. It says, a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And then he goes on to say, and just like I said, we call that a lamb. Then verse 4, and if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of persons, according to each man's needs, yourself, make <coughs> your make your count for the lamb. So now we have a lamb, and we have the lamb. So I went out into the pen where all the lambs were, and I just selected a lamb. A lamb became the lamb. Now verse 3, a lamb, any, verse 4, the. This refers to the particular lamb that was chosen. Then look at verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish a male of the first year. So we have a lamb, which went out to the flock to select your lamb. We have the lamb, the one that you selected, and it's your lamb. So it's personal. Kind of an interesting thought when you think about it. It goes from A to the to personal. Now back to verse 3. Uh, they were to select the lamb on the 10th day of the month. In verse 6, which we drop down, they were to keep it until the 14th of the month. Now there was a reason for this. This was intentional and it signified uh, significant because it allowed time for the lamb to become attached to the family and God wanted them to see the high cost of their salvation. It kind of an interesting thought when you think about it, that here you have this lamb and you're going to take care of it for four days, uh, knowing the culture, etc. Probably they kept it in the house. Uh, they took care of it like you would any newborn thing. And they grazed it up for four days, became attached to it, and then they had to kill it to, to sacrifice it for the Passover. So now we understand the value of, of that of their salvation. And and it, listen to me if you're Catholic. This became very personal business. This wasn't just a thing that was done for the sake of doing it. This became very personal. And that's the important part of it. Now, number one is that the, the cost, but it became a very personal cost. You had to invest something. You had to become a part of it. And when we partake here, and it, 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 that's the big thing about, for me in a way, it, it's the top aspect of taking communion, of, of taking the broken bread and, 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 and the symbolicness of the, of, of the juice and, and, and the cost of it. It has to be personal. And if we lose sight of the personal aspect of it, then we lose sight of the wonderfulness of the gift that Christ gave us. We lose sight of the sacrifice that was made. We lose sight of, of, of the reverence it needs to be taken with. And it shouldn't be just something that's tacked on the end of something. It shouldn't be something that's just done for the sake of doing it. It should be done because it's something personal. It's something that, that means something. It expresses something. Salvation only comes when you, when you personally select that lamb. And you personally apply it to your own life. Then salvation comes. Then the excitement of knowing Christ comes. Then the idea, as Dr. Jeremiah said this morning, the idea of diligent service. I, man, oh man, I tell you what, he challenged me this morning. I'm not going to say anymore because that, that, that was, again, it was a personal challenge to be diligent in what I'm doing and to be diligent for the rest of my life that I don't get slack and decide I just have done my part and want to rest but to keep moving. One must know him in a personal way. Exodus 12, 5 says, your lamb shall be without blemish. They were instructed to carefully select that lamb for sacrifice. Any ordinary lamb would not be sufficient. This lamb had to be without blemish, perfect. Sacrifice in order for his judgment to pass over them. In order for our sin to be atoned, there had to be a perfect sacrifice. God alone was able to provide it. Our Lord came to this earth. God robed him in flesh, offering himself the perfect sacrifice for our sins. 2 Corinthians chapter 21, verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21 says, But he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I find that an amazing thing, don't you? Really, stop and think about that for a moment. The moment you pause at the foot of the cross and you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you cried out, Father, forgive me, 
for my sin. And he asked him to come into your life and to be your Lord and your master. Then all of your sin and unrighteousness was lifted up and placed upon his shoulders upon the cross. And entering into your heart was the righteousness of a holy God. And yes, it's still mixed. I'm still a sinner. But when my heavenly Father looks down upon me, he doesn't see my sin, my unrighteousness. He sees the righteousness of my Savior. The righteousness of he who died for me and you, if you had received him. And if you're not excited about that this morning, there's something wrong. I, I, all I got to say is there's something drastically wrong. Because you, 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 boy, I tell you what, that's an exciting thing. Exodus 12 says this in verse 6. The lamb of the Passover had to be killed. You see, something had to die. And that is symbolic of you and I when we come to Christ. Something has to die. We die. Galatians tell, tells us that we are crucified with Christ and raised up to walk in newness of life. So in essence, self dies. And only that which Christ owns lives. Wow, think about it for a moment. Once the lamb was slain, they would take the hiss off and apply the blood of the lamb to the doorposts and lintels above the door. And as the Lord came through that night to slay the firstborn, when he saw the blood applied, he would pass through the loose houses where the blood had been applied. If the blood of Christ has not been applied to your heart, when the wrath of God is released upon this land, and I believe it's not long from now that it's going to be released, I don't think we have a lot of time. I personally don't have a lot of time left, whether it tarries or not. Let's face it, I'm a lot closer to the end than I am to the beginning. But put it this way, I think the Lord's going to return. And I think he may return before I leave this earth. And I think when he dies, oh, I'll leave the earth because I'll rise to be with him in glory. And what a day that's going to be. I hope we can all rise together. But as we continue through this life and, and through this bountiful thing, you know, without the shedding of blood, we have none of this. Without the shedding of the Lamb of God, had to die sacrificial death, and his blood must be applied. Revelation 1 5 says, that from, <clears throat> And from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of kings of the earth, and for him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Romans 5 9 says, Much more than being now justified by his blood, we have been saved from wrath through him. The holy sinless Son of God drank the cup of God's righteous judgment so we could escape eternal death and be reconciled unto Him so we could escape the wrath of God. I, 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 I just, I don't understand how any, anybody, God, His Son, could love me so much that He would be willing to take all of my sin upon Himself and to free me that I not have to stand and face the wrath of a holy God. I find that, I don't know about you, but boy, I, I find that just almost unbelievable. Awesome in its sense. Once you begin to understand what He has done, the awesomeness of it should motivate us to be diligent in all that we do for Him. His sacrifice receives, shields us from the horrific judgment. His sacrifice for us delivers us under the very wonderful wealth that he has for us. We also see in this verse that the lamb had to be eaten. Personal application. Salvation is personal this morning. Don't ever forget that. Salvation has to be personal. Most of you know I had four daughters. I've got 12 grandchildren. I've got eight great grandchildren running around out there. And the sad part for me is not one of them can go to heaven because of me. Every one of them have personally got to bow before a holy God. And every one of them in that personal bowing has got to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior so they'll be in glory. So you see, we may think our work stops when we walk out of church, but our work just begins because if our sons and our daughters and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren are make it on into glory, it may be because you're the picture they see of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. Think about that for a moment. What kind of picture are they seeing? What kind of a portrait are you painting for them to look at? What do they see in you? Ephesians 2 8 says, For by grace you are saved. 
but grace you are saying through faith and not of yourselves. This is the gift of God. And so I don't care who it is, son, daughter, grandchild, neighbor, friend, the one sitting next to you in church. I don't care who it is. The only way to the Lord Jesus Christ is when faith and grace apply to their lives and they're lifted up as God did with Moses. Jesus did with the disciples and he gave instructions. Look back at Mark chapter 14 and verse 13. The disciples were made, 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 were to make their way to Jerusalem looking for a man carrying a picture. When they met this man, they were to tell him the master needed room to eat the Passover and he would take them to a large room all with furnished prepared for meal. I have a question for you. If the master should visit you today and said he needed a room to eat in, uh, <clears throat> are you ready to give it to him? Are you ready to present him with his room? And I, I ask you that question because he wants the room that's in your, in your heart. And he wants the whole house. He's not just looking for a room to meet in. He wants the whole house. He wants to be able to move from room to room. He wants to be able to re repair the house. He wants to be able to fix the deck that's broken. He wants to be able to, to, to make the steps going up and down safe. He wants to take care of every part of you. So he wants the whole house. The question is, are we willing to give it to him? Or are we going to keep that closet over there locked? Are we willing to open the, to the attic and let him see all of the cobwebs and all of them? Are we willing to take him down south and let him see what it looks like? Are we willing to take him through the whole house and let him look in the corners and wipe his hand across the top of the pictures? No, I'm just kidding. Are we willing to let him do the white glove inspections of our homes? You see, if you look at your heart, is the home that he's living in now. It's the home that he's leaving from in the morning to go to work. It's the home that he's going to the beach. It's the home that he's being taken to the store to go shopping. It's a home that he's standing in line in as you wait in Walmart for that clerk that's just training and she just doesn't understand electronics anymore. It's the home that you wait and stand when you stand in line and, and the kid messes up the computer and he can't make change. It's the home that puts you behind the wheel of your car when that person doesn't pull away from the light fast enough. It's the home that looks across and sees the person on the phone on the cell phone while you sit there and wait for the light to change instead of driving through it. It's that home that he wants. My question is, does he have it? You see, though they may seem small, we must remember that our Lord has a plan for our lives. And it starts when you receive the sacrificial gifts to the Lamb that He provided for you. You see, you cannot serve Him if that life isn't completely His. The service you give, it has to come from a dedicated, given, completely given life. It has to come when He has the whole house. So my first question this morning is, have you responded to his offer of grace and received him as your personal savior? And if the answer is yes, praise the Lord. If it's no, will you? Will you take just a moment? And if you're within the sound of my voice, stop and realize how much the Lord Jesus loves you.